This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're a show that broadcasts every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 live from the downtown studios of Think Tech Hawaii here in Honolulu, Hawaii. We focus on success stories in Hawaii of both individuals and companies. Uh, and there are a lot of success stories here in Hawaii. Uh, there are you know, negative news stories out there about how challenging it is in Hawaii. Uh, and that's true, there are some challenges. But of course, there are challenges everywhere. And we have successes. We have people that have figured out how to be successful in Hawaii. And those are the stories we want to hear. So today, I've got a, a, a guest that will probably be recognized by many people, Rei Suchiyama. Uh, he and I have known each other for many, many years. He also is a, a frequent uh, guest host and host of, of other shows on Think Tech Hawaii. And he's, he's out making presentations, and he's a familiar face. So, Ray, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here because uh, you're such a proponent and advocate for small business and for creating new jobs in Hawaii. Well, you know, it, the small business environment here, which represents about 97% right. of, of all businesses in Hawaii, is a big economic engine. And we really need to support it and do what we can to, to make it thrive and, and be strong and, and keep people working. You know, and we can't ignore that. Um, but you, you and I have gone back for 20 years. We met originally in the, in the 1980s, That's correct. believe it or not. Um, and I've kind of followed your career, and, and I've seen you go places and <laughs> do things. I mean, you were in Hawaii for a long time, and then you lived in Asia for a That's while right. and, and worked for some pretty well-known companies, and, and then you just recently came back. So can you just give us a, a quick little background uh, you know, briefing on, on you and where you were born and how, where you grew up and, and that sort of thing, just for the people who don't know you? Yes, to summarize, um, my father uh, was born on Maui, but he grew up in Japan and he came back to Maui before the war. He was in the U.S. Army for 20 years wow. during World War II and Korea. And during the Korean War, he was stationed in Hokkaido, which is a beautiful island, the northernmost That's island. The northern part That's of right, Japan. lots of skiing, uh, evergreens, beautiful uh, island. And that's where he met my mother. And my mother was born and raised in Hokkaido. And I was born in, in a city called Hachinohe, which is on the seacoast of Aomori Prefecture, um, again, up north. And, but I came here when I was 10 years old, and I grew up in Kalihipalama. And, and I went through Fern Elementary, Kalakaua Intermediate, and Farrington High School, and even went to Honolulu Community College and H KCC afterwards. So I'm a very uh, local person in that regard. And then I left for the mainland and spent uh, about, uh, uh, about 10 years uh, on the e West Coast and the East Coast. And through a professor in graduate school who told me, why don't you go and check out computers? Hmm. And that's how I got into Digital Equipment Corporation, or Route 128, which was booming at that period. And then I did that, worked in computers, came back to Hawaii, and during the 80s, I was involved in real estate development uh, for Castle & Cook, in fact, and Mitsui Real Estate. And, uh, and among many things that I did was to promote high-tech park for Castle & Cook at Milani in, in, on Oahu, and also a launched, I'm very proud of, a, a magazine devoted to R&D and startups called the Hawaii High Tech Journal of that mm. time. So you've got a, a strong history in the technology side of things and in, in, in business development. That's right. Uh, so I combined uh, what I learned at DAC, but also uh, I learned uh, how to sell real estate, <laughs> uh, and I, which I did on Kapilani and King and, uh, and, and Mapuna Puna in warehouses. But I left in 91. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, wanted me to run their Asia office in Tokyo. See, MIT, now that's Ivy League stuff. This is some of the, the top universities in the, in the world. You know, and they, uh, they brought you on board to do exactly what in Japan? Corporate relations. MIT is an unusual institute in that 45% of the university is a school of engineering. Mm. It's very big. So one out of two uh, uh, students is an engineer uh, at MIT. And MIT is famous for entrepreneurship. In fact, there's more startups in Silicon Valley 
launched by MIT graduates than Stanford and, wow. and Berkeley. Because Stanford and Berkeley are, are more normal universities, maybe 15, 17 percent are you know, engineers mm -hmm. when you think about it. Mm -hmm. So they've had a rich history of interacting with business, with corporations, with lots of R&D, so that these corpora corporations see the future at MIT. And MIT faculty and researchers see what's going on at corporate labs at Fujitsu, Toyota, Hitachi, mm -hmm. Sony, uh, Mitsubishi, the leading edge companies in Japan. Right, and this is where success breeds success. I mean, when you've got MIT and they've got this focus and they're good at it, it's going to attract those types of people to come back and, and or to go there to learn these skills. Uh, and when you were traveling throughout Asia, working with MIT, what were you doing there? Were you looking for opportunities? Were you working with, uh, with MIT to, to kind of plant some uh, development seeds? Or what was going on there? I was involved in a quid pro quo where corporations set pay a fee to access research and development at MIT, ah. and also to identify areas of interest for MIT professors uh, to go in and begin dialogue with uh, companies, because when you think of a university anywhere, the best are global. They really have to know what's happening in materials in, in Toyota or semiconductors at, at uh, Hitachi. They have to know the best. It's global when you think about it. Mm -hmm. So MIT is, an, is unusual because they saw the future in Japan back in the 70s before it became very uh, big in many areas. I also, uh, after MIT, began to uh, go into uh, semiconductors, joined a startup, which became part of AOL. And uh, AOL at Time Warner, there was a great merger, as you uh, Spend a minute recall. on that for a second. That's intriguing. So there was a company that you were involved in a little bit through MIT that, that morphed and, and grew eventually into AOL? No. Uh, what, what happened at that point is that I left uh, MIT to join, uh, to go back to the private sector. Mm -hmm. And I joined Analog Devices, which was in chips, uh, uh, semiconductors, digital, digital signal processors. Digital signal processors are the heart of a chip set for mobile phones. Wow. So I began to become part of the mobile phone revolution of that time, the mid to late 90s. That led me to a startup, TGIC Communications, that was doing mobile phone software. And they were based in Seattle. And they wanted me to run Asia to uh, start uh, the Japan operations. So that's how I got to become part of a startup. But when I joined, little did I, did I know that six months later, AOL would acquire the company. There you go. Okay. And so we became part of AOL. Within another year, AOL and Time Warner would merge. Mm -hmm. And I became uh, colleagues with people from CNN, wow. Warner Brothers, uh, Films, uh, Time, uh, uh, Time Inc., um, all kinds of people. In, and, 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 of course, Cartoon Network. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I was part of a giant conglomerate in media, and there was a giant uh, experiment led by a person from Hawaii, actually, Steve Case. Yep. Yep. But there was another person from Hawaii, uh, from UH uh, named Dick Parsons, mm -hmm. who uh, got a degree from UH, and he was from New York City, who would later uh, be the CEO of Time Warner, and I worked with him also. Very good. That's a, a very intriguing and interesting background and experience. I mean, you must have picked up some pretty interesting skill sets along the way. I mean, working with all these diverse companies in the high tech industry and with startups, and, and some of these are well known large companies. You know, what are some of the, the experiences that you've had that adds to your skill set that would make you such a valuable person today? Well, I think uh, number one, I look at products uh, from a global viewpoint. That's number one. That if you're going to have a product, how can that sell in different markets? And again, it's not uh, so simple going to a new market and then launching a product in India or China, Africa, Russia, and, and that's what I- are different in Very every different. Yeah. And how do you uh, identify the right person to run your operation? Critical. I went out and went to China and hired people in Shanghai, in Beijing, in Hong Kong. Uh, I, I visited companies throughout uh, handset manufacturers from Dalian to Shenzhen to uh, Nimbus and did deals. And, and I do not speak Chinese, but I had enough 
background and negotiation skills to really uh, negotiate with anybody. And I would, of course, later on go to Southeast Asia, to Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, Singapore, set up operations and, and hire people in India and, and, and so forth. So uh, I'm, I'm a person who really uh, can go out and really analyze a market. Mm -hmm. But again, it's something that I was doing way, way back. In fact, I was studying about China in the mid-90s and published an essay for the Pacific Telecommunications uh, uh, Review on uh, the mobile market in China and published it, but I had never been there. <laughs> but I was thinking ahead. I was thinking ahead that I should be part of that revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and that you bring up another interesting point is that you've been published a number of different times, um, and, and has that helped you in, in building your your skills and, and I guess your brand, so to speak? You're correct. I really go out and try to uh, find problems that businesses face in other parts of the world or in product development, leadership, in the in internet or telecoms market and make it easy and simpler for people to understand. I think that that's where I come from. And I've, I've been a blogger for Forbes.com. Mm -hmm. I've published in New York Times. I've been quoted in the Financial uh, Times and, and Newsweek and so forth. And, and also I've been writing for Civil Week Beat on all kinds of issues too. So I think I'm unusual in that I can write for an audience in Hawaii, but also for a audience in London, New York, and Tokyo. Maybe it's about time you consider writing a book. <laughs> yeah, because you've, you've done so much writing and you've got so much experience and you've seen so many different things. Uh, you could actually write a book that would be a, a great, uh, I guess, map on how to approach getting a business set up and operational in a foreign country and what are some of the risks to avoid and what are some of the best practices. And you, know, you could look at things in a, a fresh way and provide that advice on how to expand internationally. I, I think you have a good idea. And, and uh, looking at, you know, from the Hawaii viewpoint, there are companies like Uber or Airbnb or Amazon or other companies that come out of nowhere and really grow, grow so exponentially and globally. But I don't think it's just technology. I think it's like Airbnb or Uber, flexibility and customer service. They're giving customers such more choices and so forth. So it's not technology alone. It's thinking for the customer and solving problems and issues. And I, I think we uh, think too much about technology. I think you know we do need to stay focused on the customer, but let's loop back on that right after the break. We're going to take a, a short 60-second break, and we're going to come back and continue our discussion with Ray Suchiyama on some of the international aspects and mentoring that, that he has uh, that can help companies out there. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me 1 o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner inviting you to navigate the journey. Spend the time with us as we look through and discover all of the ins and outs of this journey through life. We're on Wednesdays at 11 a.m. and I would love to have you with us. Come navigate the journey. Aloha. <music> Welcome back. This is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Uh, we just uh, took a short break uh, speaking with Ray Suchiyama. We're getting a little bit into the international area. Uh, Ray, your experience is extensive uh, in not only the technology side, but also in the international side. Um, and we were talking a little bit about customers' focus uh, and, and needing to you know, have a balance in there. Um, what, for a company that wanted to expand and, and move internationally, what are some of your thoughts on how they should approach this? 
I think number one, they need to identify maybe two, three customers in that market first and really use them to not to sell, but to give advice back. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be sold on something, but everybody wants to give advice <laughs> and be an expert. Uh, and, and so, and, and, they would, and the questions to ask are, if we did this A, B, and C, would you buy it? Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, yeah, I would. At what price? Yeah, and, and then you would come up with, with the product and you're developing product and you really have a customer already made in that uh, market. Now, another one is uh, to uh, test it out uh, with, with uh, people, um, uh, with uh, consumers or B, uh, B2B uh, customers, uh, big companies in uh, a foreign market. And uh, finally, uh, to get some kind of channel. Are you going to go direct? Are you going to go through a distributor? Mm -hmm. uh, do you go to uh, set up a um, you know, joint venture, a partnership? There's many, many um, forms you can, uh, channels mm -hmm. you can go through. But again, that, that is another um, uh, analysis you can take. And, and, to, and who do you, what are the right profile of person that you hire uh, for that market? Well, and this, these are all things that, you know, because of your background experience, you could probably help a company go through this process. You know, and that's a, that sounds like a very exciting type of uh, a career to have, uh, as well as a very valuable service for companies that are thinking about going international. Um, you know, it, it, you, you seem to have a, a teaching element in you somewhere, in your DNA somewhere. You like to share this information, you like to write about it, you like to talk about it. I mean, you, um, you could probably be a very valuable mentor. I mean, do you see yourself as, as mentoring people and helping them through this process? Currently, I mentor several um, UH MBA students, in fact, and uh, one of them is in Hong Kong today and studying Chinese and uh, attending classes there. Another one uh, studied Japanese and starting um, uh, out more in that direction. I also mentor um, a, um, uh, a woman who's uh, a graduate of Molokai High School. Wow. At Columbia University. Super. And she's uh, going to be studying mechanical engineering. Wow. Impressive. And there's another uh, young man, at, also from Molokai uh, High School, who um, uh, I introduced to people who uh, helped him in, in advancing his uh, math and science um, uh, uh, credits. And he's now entering as a freshman at Syracuse Engineering uh, Bachelor. So I try to go out, but I think what I try to do is that I'm from Kalihi. I'm from Kalihi Palama, and and uh, and that I feel that um, there's a, a reservoir of people who really can go up several levels. But there's a lot of a lot of things to do, and in terms of attitude, in terms of mentoring, in terms of programs and so forth. So. I see that partly as uh, my uh, payback back to my community where I grew up, but also I enjoy uh, working with young people to really s let them see a bigger world and, and get them uh, going on that road because it's themselves in the end who really are going to be uh, making a mark on, on our society. Now, you, you've been successful. You've come from the Klihi environment. Um, others have come from the Klihi environment and become successful. Um, what do you think the secrets are to their success? What do they have that's different that makes them a success? Uh, interestingly, I tell people, and people get very uh, kind of um, uh, surprised when I say this, I did well in global markets, in India, China, Africa, Russia, or Southeast Asia, or U even Europe, because of my background in Kalihi. Because in Kalihi, you're taught to respect others. Mm. Ah, that's something that is, is, comes naturally to me. So uh, I don't impose my culture or where I come from. I ask questions and, and kind of understand where this person is coming from, what language, what culture, what religion, what background. And so that in Kalihi, there's all kinds of people, and people who've been there for ages or people who just came as immigrants very recently. It's a dynamic mix. And I think that, that 
is what really was uh, a factor for success, uh, speaking for myself, but other people also. And, and they know that they're going to be, uh, you know, uh, coming head to head with other people from better schools, better backgrounds, better language. But I think uh, our uh, feeling for or drive for respect for others is something that I take from my Kalihi background. Yeah, and that's uh, all, all kind of folds into that attitude of, you know, respect, um, you know, listen more, talk less, uh, find out as much as you can about something before you act on it. You know, I mean, it's, it's the attitude of can do, but let me do it right. You know. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. In mentoring, especially, it's not just listening, it's great listening. Because you, as a mentor, uh, you, you have to really uh, uh, be quiet. Because automatically, you want to give a story of <laughs> the past. It may or may not help uh, at that instance. But you have to get more out of that mentee in order to frame the story that helps that person. And it's an uh, actionable response. That's mm -hmm. what I want to say, an actionable response. You can say, oh, do this, do that. But it may have worked some time ago. It may not work today. But that, that's the focus. I don't care where you came from, but we're talking about today, now, and where you're going to go in the future. Exactly. That's where the key is. Well, and, and on that theme, uh, you know, you've got this international perspective. You've worked with very successful individuals and businesses in the past. Now, bringing it back to Hawaii for a second, um, in my opening monologue, I mentioned that we've got challenges here and it's not an easy environment, um, but there are people who have made it. Um, what are your thoughts? What do you think Hawaii needs to do in order for it to move in the direction that's going to be I guess positive for the economy and positive for the state. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think we have to leverage what is Hawaii, first of all. And Hawaii is indeed a melting pot of languages, of cultures, of all kinds of different people. And yet, if, if at UH or even at uh, Bishop Street, what we don't do is to combine these strengths in an innovative fashion. For example, if I was a leader at UH, I would take the best in software engineering, best in Chinese and Japanese languages, and the best in travel management, and come up with new mobile apps for the tourism industry, mm. globally. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. But that's all here, but they're unconnected with each other. You see, but it needs a vision to propel uh, for innovation because we cannot compete on those things by itself. We cannot be like Stanford in co uh, computer right. engineering, right. but we uh, or software engineering. But we have different elements that we can really, uh, really count on and uh, be uh, advancing in environmental, in, in uh, coastal areas, maybe become a center for uh, disaster management training for the Pacific. Mm -hmm. We have all kinds of different elements in Waikiki for training. We have people at East West Center. We have people in to put them all together. Right now, they're very different. There's a lot of things at PACOM also, and uh, the DOD that we're not leveraging also. There should be in a normal society a ring of high-tech startups around Camp Smith and Schofield and mm -hmm. others, you know, getting off of uh, a leveraging DOD uh, uh, research for commercial use, for products to uh, export. Well, especially on Kauai. I mean, Barking Sands is a perfect location for this type of high-tech development uh, you know, presence, you know, and we seem to be missing that opportunity a little bit in some respects. Um, but, you know, I think that's a very novel insight is because sometimes I hear solutions to diversifying the economy in Hawaii with what I feel is some unrealistic expectations. I mean, we have to realize that we do have limitations and there are some challenges here, the cost of living, you know, the, the availability of resources. So we got to take a look at what we're good at, as right. you've already said and capitalize that and expand on that. We don't have to create something new. We just need to do what we're doing now a little bit better and smarter. Correct. What are, what are our strengths in Hawaii? That's the first thing. We cannot go off and do better on weaknesses, the strengths. And how can we combine the strengths and make it 
ultra str strong. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other element is uh, what we talked about before is customers. We have to be customer centric. And uh, the history of Hawaii is that people came here, we didn't go out mm -hmm. to knock on doors and say, well, how can we solve your problem in Japan or China or Southeast Asia or Europe, uh, Latin America? And I think that, that's an area where we really have to do a lot more training. But you see, in the late 19th century, King Kalakaua sent dozens of young people, Hawaiian people, to study Japanese, Chinese, go to Italy, go to the UK. What for? sustainable agriculture for exports. He was thinking back then. It is not something brand new. It is something right, in it's our... It's not a radical thought. No, I mean, no. Something's been around. And he was very technologically savvy. He put in electric lights in the Ilani Palace before the White House. <laughs> so, right. and, and the first car in Hawaii was an electric car, not a gasoline now, pretty, uh, in, in, uh, car. So these are a lot of things in our history that we can point to. Like Governor Burns said in, in the early 60s, he desired a Hawaii economy, quote, based on research, unquote. This was barely five years after statehood. Look what a vision he had. He would be uh, admonishing us to take advantage of our state I to go ahead. I was just going to say to look in, at the in, lost in, opportunity. If we had gotten started back then, I mean, the research capabilities that we would have in, in oceans and in, in astronomy and other different areas, it is perfect for us here. Uh, we just don't seem to be have taken full advantage of those. To commercialize it, that, that's the key. I'll give you an example, Gatorade. You drink that yeah, out there, you know where it's from? University of Florida. They developed that, it's for the Gators, uh, the football team. Right. And now they get millions of dollars in, in uh, commercialization and licensing royalties back to that university. Again, that, that's, that's, a, that's a product. So we're not looking at research as a way to create products to sell and get revenues. That, that's a culture of, of uh, innovation that we have in, uh, we should have in UH and all throughout our society in Hawaii, because that's where we're gonna go, because you said at the beginning, this is a small company, small business town uh, in many ways, but that startups are the same. The yep. startups are identical. But you know, Ray, I wish we had more time to okay. talk, but we've reached the end of the show. I, I think the next step is to you write a book that gives us the map on how to make this happen here in Hawaii. Uh, and then maybe after the book gets published, you can be our next governor. Well, thank you, and I'll, uh, but in the meantime, I'll be happy to help out any organization in Hawaii. Super. Uh, thank you very much, Ray. This is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. Uh, and we focus on successful individuals and companies that have made it work here in Hawaii. So hopefully I'll see you next week. Until then, aloha.